Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I am Georgia Zarola, a senior undergraduate studying human development and family studies in the School of Human Ecology. I'm originally from Acton, Massachusetts, and I am an intern for Reach Out and Read Wisconsin this year. During the month of October, Badger Talks Live will be highlighting some of the trending topics coming from the UW School of Human Ecology. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Depesh Navsaria, Associate Professor of General Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine and Clinical Associate Professor of Human Development and Family Studies. Today, he will be exploring the concepts of how diverse themes, texts, and illustrations matter deeply in children's books and go well beyond simply allowing those from historically marginalized groups to just see themselves. He will reflect on how it ultimately matters to us all as a society. Depeche is a pediatrician working in the public interest. He blends the roles of physician, occasional children's librarian, educator, public health professional, and child health advocate. With degrees in public health, children's librarianship, physician assistant studies, and medicine, he brings a unique combination of interests and experience together. In addition to his professorships, he is also the faculty outreach fellow at the Child Development Lab at the School of Human Ecology. He has practiced primary care pediatrics in a variety of settings with special interest in underserved populations and continues to practice in outpatient settings. Depeche aims to educate the next generation of those who work with children and families in realizing how their professional roles include being involved in larger concepts of social policy and how they may affect the cognitive and socio-emotional development of children for their future benefit. Depeche will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to post them in the chat at any point. Please welcome Dr. Depeche Navsaria. Great, thank you so much, Georgia. I really appreciate it. Um, so it's a delight to spend some time with all of you today to uh, discuss um, the issue of diversity in children's books and why this matters to all of us really in, uh, in, in different ways. Um, because uh, I think there's a lot of talk about diversity, about equity, about inclusion, all of that. Um, and I think we don't necessarily always have the best sense of what, why. Like, why does this matter? And how can we make sure we don't um, fall into uh, some of the pitfalls that, that, can, that can sometimes occur? All right. So I want to start off with some acknowledgments because there are a lot of wonderful people doing work in this area. And I will name check them as I go through some of these slides, since some of them is some of this is really their work, um, their thinking, their thoughts, their approach um, as we um, talk about all of this material. And there may be people that I inadvertently um, forget. And uh, that is uh, an oversight on my part and certainly not intentional in, in any way as we do so. so Let's think about some statistics around diverse uh, diversity in books and all. And some of that work has been has been done right here on this campus at the Cooperative Children's Book Center. This image that um, I'm showing here uh, highlights the uh, some data that the CCBC has been compiling for a number of years. Now, if any of you are not familiar with the Cooperative Children's Book Center, um, it is a um, a teaching education research library uh, on campus um, that is a wonderful wealth of not just the books, but also staff that think about children's books and talk about children's books um, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, there are not too many libraries like this uh, in the country, and uh, we are thrilled to have one of them right here on campus. And I count them among my, my many uh, intellectual friends uh, in so many different ways in the work I do on early literacy. So if you look at this data, um, which was illustrated by uh, David Huick um, and uh, uh, with the assistance also of uh, Sarah Park Dalen, um, you can see some things that are really rather shocking here. So this is looking at 2018 at all the children's books that were published in that year, okay? And uh, you can see on the far right there that about 50% of the books had characters that were white, right? They were clearly identifiable as, as white um, characters, whether they were children or adults or whatever. 27% of the books uh, involved characters that were animals or something else, right? It might be a robot or something else, but not, not human, you know, uh, but clearly a character. 
Then you look at characters of, uh, of color. Only 10% were black characters, 7%, um, you know, Asian Pacific Islander, et cetera. Um, uh, Latinx characters, only 5%. And then American Indians or First Nations, to use the Canadian uh, terminology, uh, 1%, right? So this is shocking when you look at this data because you're more likely to see a character that is non-human right, an animal or something else, then you are to see a character that is a human of color um, in, in these books. Uh, now, there has been some improvement. Um, the first round of these statistics that um, I found easily was, um, that had been compiled well, was 2015, right? And there's continued to be some improvement, but we still see this massive skew in terms of uh, what's, what's out there. So certainly diversity matters. And encouraging the use of diverse books uh, is, makes a big difference, and, and we'll spend some time talking through that uh, in a number of ways. I want to start, however, by, by highlighting um, the, the well-meaning, the well-intentioned approaches that people will often use to saying, oh, yes, 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 we need to increase diversity in, in books. Um, sometimes these approaches can be well-intentioned, but are not necessarily quite right. Um, and, and, and here's, we'll, we'll go through why. Uh, it, avoid exclusively using something that's been termed uh, the five Fs, okay? So books that focus on just a few particular themes. So food, right? Um, books that talk about Mexican or Chinese cuisine only, right, um, is one of the Fs. Fashion, right, that may talk about Native American regalia or something along, along those lines. Folklore, uh, traditional tales that are found in, in many different traditions uh, that out there um, to, to tell, to retell or tell uh, one of those tales. Festivals, uh, Kwanzaa is a well-known one. Uh, Cinco de Mayo is another one. Or famous people, right? Uh, the, there's heaps of books out there about U.S. civil rights leaders um, back in the 1960s um, and, and before and after and all that. Now, you may look at this and say, okay, but this constitutes a lot of diverse books, uh, a lot of categories of, of diversity. Why wouldn't we possibly, why wouldn't we use these? Why would we um, not promote these to the extent possible? And the reason really is that it leads to a mindset of overgeneralization, right? That you start to think about a particular culture or particular people or a particular group of folks only in these, uh, these areas of particular food, fashion, folklore, festivals, you know, uh, famous people, etc. Um, it's not to say that you can never use these, but but don't. That's that's not the point here. The point is to say if this is the entirety of how we are promoting diversity in books, um, then you can end up with issues, and you can end up um, causing people to lump people in way other people in ways that they might not otherwise recognize. So for example, um, you might, uh, you may be someone who, who, who um, uh, is uh, a, has been here in the United States, your family has been here for many generations, and you may read a book about um, India, uh, Indian festivals like Holi, right? And then you might come and talk to me and say, oh, your name appears to be South Asian, it is of South Asian heritage, um, and you may um, uh, look at me and say he appears to be genetically of South Asian um, uh, descent. I am. Uh, and you might ask me about how important I find holy and talk about whatever you know from reading a book about this. Um, holy is not a holiday that is personally significant to me. It is not anything I have really celebrated. Um, and honestly, when I read about Holi and how it is done in India, is like, oh, okay, I've never actually seen that. Um, I have been to India twice in my entire life. Um, I, I was born in London, grew up in New York City. It is a, you know, Holi is not something that's relevant to me, right? But if you have this overgeneralized mindset that this is what Indian people do, or this is the kinds of foods that, that are used, um, 
it leads you to treat people as, as to treat certain people as the category they're in and what you think that category is rather than anything else. So I think it's important to think about um, not falling into that trap. Again, these books, these classes are fine as long as they're not the only thing out there. So moving on, we need to talk about some important things like the issue of race. Um, because as a society, this is something that causes us a lot of um, angst and anxiety in many ways. The most common issue that I hear people talk about when they say, well, I, I don't think we should talk to young children about race because young children are innocent. They don't understand race. And when we start talking about race, we put these ideas in their head. The data goes completely against that. I will tell you this clearly right now, that infants are able to discern um, differences in people based on um, their, their, the race that they present, at, uh, present as. Um, so this notion that children don't see race, well, I'm sorry, it's, it's actually not that we have good data from our friends in the psychology world who show that kids do notice this. And the, so one, it's already being noticed, it's already there. And then it leads to another issue here, right? There's this notion of, well, if we don't talk about race, if we're colorblind, if we talk about everyone equally and don't necessarily discuss race um, in any way, shape or form, then my kids won't see race. Well, we've already pointed out that kids are already noticing this. Um, so if you don't actually talk about race, it leads to something interesting. So children, and I would actually argue adults as well, um, have this phenomenon that we call essentialist thinking, okay? So I'll give you an example here. If a young child sees um, uh, individuals who are experiencing homelessness, um, um, you know, on, on the street, um, and in most communities, a lot of the folks that fall into that category tend to be individuals of color. Not always, but they, they can be, or they're disproportionately more individuals of color. If a child is not, um, is, is no other conversation from their parents or other caregivers about race and how we think about that, then what can happen is they think, hmm, well, this person is clearly, they do not have a home. Um, they may uh, not be clean because they have nowhere to shower, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this must have something to do with their darker skin, right? And, and there must be something about darker skin in and of itself that leads to being in this situation, as opposed to a much more complicated, nuanced notion like, well, it has to do with generational trauma, historical racism, historical and current racism, discrimination and bias, et cetera, et cetera, right? The world is complicated. You can't expect uh, a three or a four year old to suddenly come up with that on their own. So if you allow this essentialist thinking that there must be something different, well, about that person simply because of, of their race, well, then you're not offering any other guidance in the world here. Um, and that becomes, becomes a challenge. So uh, what we end up with then is uh, having to, you know, deconstruct those notions later on. Uh, and mind you, this has an impact. Uh, there's actually really good research out there of medical students um, that showed that if you ask them um, questions like, you know, uh, on a scale of one to five, how true is the statement that uh, black skin uh, is more impervious to pain, you know, or is tougher, et cetera. Um, a shocking number said yes, right? That there was something inherently different beyond just the fact that there's more melanin. For the record, there is no difference right there, uh, that no such thing, but it can lead to uh, decreased use of anesthesia or, or um, uh, offering um, uh, medication for pain or things like that. So this is really downstream real world implications uh, that, that matter. The other thing, about talking about race is that for those who may be subject to bias and discrimination, and by the way, I'm focusing on race and so much of this, one can also think about this in terms of gender, um, in terms of um, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, you know, and so forth, uh, in terms of disability, uh, national origin, language, right? 
all of these things um, can all come under the these categories again talking more about race but again this this can apply to so many different uh, categories here um, is that if you're falling into one of these groups talking to children about these differences um, helps do something that we call preparation for bias let me be really clear this is not about saying you know you're going to get discriminated against so you better be ready for this and be anxious and worried and, and and so on it's to say when bias happens because it will happen and discrimination happens and so on how can you cope with it you know how can you make sure you're still emotionally okay how can you handle these situations and mind you for children that fall into the dominant majority populations like white children um uh, that how do you prepare for allyship, right? To help people say, hey, wait a minute, something's happening here, and I notice something that shouldn't be happening, and how can I intervene, um, and how can I notice that there? So when we have these conversations about differences, when we start talking about and, and giving children resources that allow them to see into different worlds and so on, um, we start setting a foundation to be able to do these sorts of things, which, by the way, have been um, shown through a lot of study analysis and other work um, to be reasonably effective if, if done well. So we need to be recognizing how much talking about all these things and having diversity in books makes such a key difference. Okay, so the Wisconsin Science Festival's theme is glass. And you might say, okay, this is wonderful, but I haven't heard you say anything about glass. And what do books have to do with glass anyway, right? Um, well, I'll tell you why. There's a quote here that I'll read out from uh, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, um, who in 1990 in an article offered this wonderful way of thinking about what is it about the content of books that makes such a key difference. And she said, books are sometimes windows offering views of the world that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk through in imagination to become part of whatever world has been created or recreated by the author. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us. And in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experiences as part of a larger human experience. Reading then becomes a means of self-affirmation and readers often see their mirrors in books. So using that as a frame, let's talk through a few things. Let's start with this notion of mirrors, right? We talk about this a lot in terms of, hmm, when do children, how can children see themselves represented in books? Because as we just saw from those CCBC statistics, many children aren't. So let me show you a cover of uh, a, a Mother Goose book, okay? And I, I kind of picked this at random. Um, this is a fairly typical kind of collection of Mother Goose rhymes, right? And um, this is, you know, there's um, uh, a woman who appears to look somewhat witch-like with a pointed hat and all. She's riding a goose and uh, there's a uh, baby in the basket there, okay? And you can see this is a white baby, looks <clears throat> somewhat blonde. Um, uh, the mother goose herself, uh, um, the, the woman in the picture, appears to, to be white as well, right? And the, and the whole style is, um, you know, uh, probably derived and based on a, a European tradition. Um, it's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with it necessarily inherently, um, but you can imagine if you were to open this, uh, what all the pictures and illustrations may be like. Mm -hmm. Now, let me show you a contrasting mother goose. Um, this is a, a, by uh, Nina Cruz. It's called The Neighborhood Mother Goose. Now, the text in this book is pretty much the same as almost any other Mother Goose book out there. It is the standard pantheon of Mother Goose rhymes. But what Nina Cruz did was she took photographs of um, Bro a Brooklyn neighborhood and uh, did some editing and moving in, as you'll see in some of the examples here but gave a very different view uh, and an and accompanying set of illustrations to familiar Mother Goose. So here's, you know, the hey diddle diddle, the cat on the fettle, the cow jumped over the moon, right? So the text is there. You can see she's inserted 
um, some pictures of, you know, uh, 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 a dish and a spoon and <clears throat> the cow jumping over the moon there and all. Um, but you notice um, other things here, right? You notice there's a little boy there, right? Uh, he's dressed very casually um, and he fairly clearly uh, presents as black. Also, look at the surroundings that he's in, okay? There's a fence here. Um, there's fire escapes visible. There's um, bars over some of the lower windows, um, some brickwork. Uh, you can see there's kind of a flat side of a, of a home there, the white, the white brick wall there. Um, this is a landscape that actually is much more familiar to me. Um, I did not grow up uh, in Manhattan or Brooklyn. I grew up in a rather suburban area of Queens, but I spent you know, plenty of time um, in uh, other parts of the city where the density was much higher and this was um, a very familiar look to things, right? Um, this may be familiar to a lot of children who are growing up in um, an urban city environment versus the cover that I that I just, just showed you. And, and this does matter. Um, sorry about the low resolution on this image. I uh, was frantically searching for my own copy of this book and, and couldn't find it. So I, I pulled the screen grab off um, this is all from the same book. Um, you can see uh, a few children playing on a playground here. There's a little girl there in a yellow dress on the left. Um, the look of joy and glee on her face as she's playing and her, her hair kind of, you know, uh, moving as she, she runs. Um, my, my own children are, um, are adopted. They, are, uh, they present as Black. Um, they are now um, in college. Uh, so this is this is what I'm about to tell you is from quite a few years ago. But um, I remember uh, my son, he's older by a year. We were looking at the, the we were reading the neighborhood mother goose together. And he would, when we got to this page, he would point at the little girl in the yellow dress. And he would say, you know, look, it's my sister, because there is a, a, a resemblance there, you know, the, the hair and everything. Um, right. So he saw someone very familiar to him in this book, which he wouldn't see necessarily in um, the other uh, Mother Goose book. Um, I'll also say there's a page in the book where they're inside and you see a wooden parquet floor kind of with the distinctive overlapping. Uh, and at the time we lived in a home, the, an old Victorian that had a similar floor. And he also said, look, it's our floor. So um, diversity can also extend to flooring apparently as, as well. <laughs> So, but I think this gives you an idea of what we mean about mirrors, about children being able to see themselves. And I'm just talking about images here. It can also be, of course, in the text, in the narrative, in all those different things. Books can also provide windows to other worlds, right, that you, you may not actually live in or experience. Imagine, for example, if you're a child growing up in um, the southern United States, where you don't see snow. Now, this is not anything that uh, would be a surprise to us here in Wisconsin, but hey, you know, I have colleagues who, uh, you know, they get one snowfall and, you know, one, everything's canceled because everything shuts down. Uh, but number two, um, they're out there going, oh my goodness, this is so magical. Um, unlike us who are usually um, getting sick of shoveling it after a certain point, <laughs> snow's fun as well. Um, but this is a book from 1962, right? This is not a recent book, uh, the famed Ezra Jack Keats, The Snowy Day, which is about a, a, a kid enjoying their, the, a day in the snow and all the things they get to do. I'm also going to point something out here. Not all diversity in books has to kind of hit you in the head, right? And say, look at how diverse it is, this is, you know, there's this sometimes roles for that. Um, but The Snowy Day is about a little boy enjoying their, their day in the snow, the child also happens to be Black. It is not a centerpiece of the story. It is not something that um, is being called out. They just happen to be doing things. There's a reason for this, and, and we'll, we'll come to that, or a reason that it matters. Um, there can also be other things. If you are someone who um, has uh, straight hair, um, and, uh, you know, and it's relatively easy to comb, well, the fact that if you have curly hair can be a challenge. This is a book called Hair Love. This is a much more recent publication just in the last few years here by Matthew Cherry. Um, and this is a touching story. It's a touching story of a little girl um, who has big poofy hair. My daughter's hair is much like this. Um, and uh, her dad trying to figure out how to 
care for it properly and take care of it, right? And you can see this dialogue where they try to cover it with a hat and he's like, look, dad, we can do more than that, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And, and the story goes on um, that, oh, you know, and, and, and here's the other thing. This is also a window into the world of a father, a father of color parenting and enjoying parenting and being funny and sweet and charming and doing the tasks of parenting. Okay, let's remember, right, that people sometimes get willinized, right? There's a whole trope out there about, you know, fathers of color don't care or they don't engage with, with their family and that they, they would never know how to care for a, a daughter or whatever. And this is so untrue. There's scads of data on this, right? But this is something that people believe. And to, to see this depicted, and I say this as someone who um, had has had to, uh, over the years, um, be at least one of the people dealing uh, with, with my daughter's hair, um, sometimes not necessarily successfully, right? People see themselves or they see other people in different ways um, or worlds that they might not otherwise experience. Here's another relatively recent book, Caldecott Weather, uh, Weather what metal winner um, called Watercress. Um, and in this, this is about um, uh, a, a family that emigrated. Um, and uh, you can see th there's, there's these moments, right? Like where they're driving along and suddenly they see wild watercress and uh, the family, they pull over, right? And they say, you know, take off your shoes. Uh, you need to you need to help us gather this wild watercress, right? And you know, you can see them having this experience. This is like, wait a minute, this is not something many folks would think about, right? Wait a minute, you stop and you just gather this watercress and waiting in this water. There's another way though, in which also this is this book can be a mirror. Um, here's a page, right? Um, where the, 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 the narrator is saying, a car passes by and I duck my head, hoping it's no one I know, right? Because they don't want to be seen stopped by the side of the road gathering plants this is weird i'm going to be embarrassed in front of my friends right this is the immigrant experience right the immigrant child experience my family does things that are odd and they make me deeply uncomfortable right yeah. um right this is something that that speaks to 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 children growing up who might say my family's cultural differences are something that i i struggle with right okay great someone else feels that way but also, there's a there's this whole storyline. I won't ruin it for you, but there's a whole storyline about um, moving from another country, from China in this case, and what happened and all, um, and family stories and so on. Right? This may or may not be familiar to others, right? In different ways. And sometimes what this does is I talked about preparation for bias, but also preparation for allyship. That what the thing about windows is that we generally don't travel through them right, that we look through the glass at the worlds that are on the other side. Well, what else? You can't move into that world, though. Ah, and that's where the notion of sliding glass doors comes in, right, that maybe you're looking through that world, but when the time is right and you're ready, you can slide that open, and now you can enter into that other world and be a part of that, right? That's part of why I chose that moment of the, 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 immigrant child experience because they sit in that world their their parents may be much more comfortable in a world that is more culturally like the one they knew but as you move in is that but your children um need to exist in that that different world as well right they need to be able to open that door and walk through it in different ways and i say this so i'm an immigrant myself um i was born in london as i mentioned before um and emigrated to the u.s but i was only a year old um and so many of my experiences were much more like that of um, a child of immigrants growing up and dealing with the different worlds, right? That you have to move between the world of your parents and, and extended family and the world that you're um, now in, immersed in, in school and, and so on. Um, and here's a book. This is a little bit older. This is a chapter book uh, instead of a picture book, Maybe, Maybe Marisol Rainey. Um, by Aaron and Trotta Kelly. And this is about a little girl who's, um, one, she's um, finds herself sometimes not well understood by people around her who all say, oh, she's so sensitive, she's so emotional, you know, things like that. Um, but she's working on coping with 
the world with her hesitation about trying new things, doing new things, et cetera. Um, she also happens to be um, a, a Filipina American, right? Um, her family, family is of Filipino heritage. Her dad is gone most of the week uh, at work because he works on an oil rig in uh, the Gulf, right? So he's actually on the rig and only back at other times, right? These are different experiences, right, that some children have um, and uh, and that we may not, we, we may know nothing about, right? So there's all sorts of different things told in a beautifully compelling, well-told story in so many ways, so. But we also think, so we talked, we talked about mirrors, we talked about windows, we talked about the sliding glass doors. But in other ways also, books can also serve as maps, right? That where else can we go? What's the world that we wanna see out there? What's the new things, right? Maybe books are telling us about um, things internationally or futures that might be, or something like that, right? How can it help signpost what the world of possibilities are out there. If you grew up like I did in a major urban city, um, knowing anything about farming um, may be something that's hard. Uh, my wife who grew up on a farm in rural Wisconsin um, uh, uh, laughed when I told her that the only time I had smelled a skunk growing up was at an exhibit at the Bronx Zoo uh, because there's not too many skunks um, in urban areas and they're not usually getting hit on the road and smelling for you to even smell when you drive by, right? Um, so the, those other worlds that are out there, books can serve as maps to help you signpost how do you even think about getting to those different worlds that are, that are, that are out there in different ways. So let me give you some practical considerations that you can now perhaps <clears throat> think about and, and uh, take away from, from today. So first of all, um, include characters who share your child's race, ethnicity, and your cultural and religious beliefs, as well as characters who do not, right? You should not necessarily only give people, children books that are about the group that they are in, right? It's again, the mirrors and the windows um, that, are, that are out there. Um, look for books that have a main character who is a person of color. Not only is this important for all the reasons we've talked about, frankly, it also helps create a market. Even if you're borrowing the book from the library, right, it shows demand for books of this sort. Look for books that provide a voice to those who rarely have one, right? How are people's lives being depicted and, and, uh, and shown and their experiences um, who aren't generally heard or seen or aren't what people think of as the, the default, right, that's out there. Um, look at books that challenge myths and stereotypes, right? We talked about care love, right? Um, because again, there are stereotypes are often not necessarily correct, right? And challenging those in these depictions from a young age um, does, does matter. Tell stories that normalize daily life among all racial identities. Right, so the book Corduroy, right, which everyone thinks of, oh, the bear, you know, and all that. Yes, the bear. It's written and illustrated by Don Freeman, who's a black author and illustrator. Um, it's about a black mother and child going shopping, right? And again, you might stop and think, wait a minute, what's what's the race or ethnicity of those of those folks, right? That's the point, right? They go shopping just like anyone else. It's not simply about food or holidays or or. Um, or famous people that happen to be black, right? They're going shopping like everyone else, much like the snowy day, right? Other things, help children and youth develop social action skills, right? Um, uh, books can also be uh, those maps as to how can you make a difference in the world? How can you help others um, may, you know, um, make a difference in the, in the lives of, of other people? Help Children and youth also recognize inequities in social structure, right? Um, there's a lot of books out there that take on gender in sports, right? Or differential treatment of, uh, of holidays within the US, right? Recognizing that there, these inequities do, do exist. Um, and sometimes those can be tales that are historical or they can be historical fiction, um, but they can highlight that those differences are out there and do make a difference. Let's also support those that are writing and illustrating and publishing and distributing and all those, the books, right? That we need more writers that are from these groups because they are woefully underrepresented. Um, and we, and again, let's create a market for 
um, these sorts of books and these authors doing this sort of work. Of course, look for age appropriate books. I, can, I could talk for hours about this, right? But picture books for the youngest ones, um, chapter books for the elementary age children and older children. Um, and then, of course, for teens, um, thinking about longer books, novels, and graphic novels, right? This extends throughout the continuum of all this. I would argue this also matters for adult literature, but hey, mm -hmm. I'm a pediatrician. We'll stick to the kids. Um, look for books that present characters that are facing real life experiences. Um, because it does matter. It does matter to tell the story of uh, people who may have experienced bias because it can help you recognize it when it happens around you. And then, of course, showcase experiences relevant to their own. We talked about the snowy day and, uh, and how that plays into all of this. I want to say a few words also about work that I uh, do that, that does try to aim at helping uh, parents and children share books from an early age, um, and that we are, of course, working uh, assiduously to, to try to make sure that we are providing books that are diverse um, in all these ways for all these reasons. Um, the program I'm referring to is, is Reach Out and Read. I am the uh, 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 founding medical director of Reach Out and Read Wisconsin, and I also happen to be the current uh, board chair of the Reach Out and Read nationally. Um, so I'll, my conflict of interest disclosures, even though I get paid almost nothing to do all that work. Um, Reach Out and Read takes the regular checkups that we do with children, and it takes that opportunity to for the healthcare provider um, to ask about shared book reading um, and to either bolster, reinforce, and, and praise families for doing this with their young children, um, or look for issues like, you know, oh, um, you, you say your toddler doesn't like reading being read to anymore. Um, tell me a little bit more about that, right? And it turns out it's a squirmy toddler who has a naturally short attention span that's normal. How do we help support that and help parents find ways of engaging with books with that child until they, they become older? If I had to summarize Reach Out and Read in a single graphic, it's this item that I'm showing here, uh, the prescription to read. Um, you notice it says share books together. It's not just read books, but share it together. It's about making this this connected experience. Um, and this whole notion of relational health, that when we support strong relationships within families, there's a deep science about how much of a difference this makes. And that encouraging shared reading is a wonderful scaffold for that beyond everything I've already talked about, about how we talk about books, what's in the books, who's writing them, who's creating them, and do children, do they have that moment to be allowed uh, to be seen and so on. If you're interested in all these things that we've discussed today about uh, books, reading, diversity in books, um, parenting, et cetera, and you're not sick of hearing my voice, uh, we do have a podcast called the Reach Out and Read Podcast. And yes, I am the host. Uh, we have 60-something uh, episodes already dropped over the last two years. This is one of the great things that came out of the pandemic. Uh, in fact, if you look at our first two episodes, they specifically are um, about diversity in children's books and why it matters. And uh, uh, we have an uh, interview with an illustrator and we have some other episodes that also covers this in different ways. And then finally, um, I'll end by noting, uh, yes, I talked about mirrors. I talked about windows. I talked about sliding glass doors. Maps, well, maps aren't glass. Well, there are some maps that are glass. This is the Meparium in Boston. Uh, uh, which is a beautiful stained glass depiction of the world. So I thought I'd give one more nod to the world of glass um, as this important metaphor to how we think about all these sorts of things. Peering up there are my public facing social media and uh, my email if there are questions or things that you think about after today. Um, but having covered all that, I would be happy to take whatever questions you might have at this point. Thank you so much. Wow, lots of food for thought and um, so many things you say just make complete common sense why we don't just naturally think that way, right? Like it seems like we're not trained to just automatically think the way you're saying and it makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, so this all should be in the, the parent handbook that every person gets before they become a parent. So um, hello that is everybody. Exactly, that is exactly the nature of of. of bias, right? It's these little shorthands that you start to look for these things that are 
what you think of as the norm and until it's pointed out and you start saying oh i need to look for this um you're not naturally going to do that and that's okay we all do this i do this too and uh, it takes a while to train yourself out of it Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. We're talking with Dr. Depeche Navsaria today about diversity in children's books. And he's given us some great resources here. If you're listening on Facebook or YouTube, I've posted links in the chat. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, ask or point out about is on the Cooperative Children's Book Center, um, I see there's a book of the week. That's yeah. pretty exciting stuff. And I think what a great resource for parents. I mean, heck, you can just go pick the book of the week and, and read that without having to really do any kind of research or digging for materials at all. Um, how are those selected? Mm -hmm. um, that would be a great question for the CCBC itself. But I'm, I'm also going to say that that um, this is actually where librarians are, are, are such a treasure, right? So the stereotype of librarians, you know, is that they're they're checking out the books or whatever and and all. But let's remember, right, that the reference librarians are are a marvel of of information, right? Um, they not only can can get the book that you want, right? They're very good at asking, well, what is it you're looking for? So if you show up and say, my child really likes books about X, or I'm looking for books that cover this theme right? They'll be able to start pulling things like that and guiding you in that direction. Um, it's actually inter interesting. So I have a library degree myself, and uh, I uh, realized when we learned the basics of reference interview that it was actually shockingly like medical interviewing in, in terms of getting to that like same, same basic concepts and ideas. So um, a place where I didn't expect the, the two of my worlds that I, I inhabit to, to kind of overlap. But um, yeah, they 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 can uh, the these book selections that they offer are wonderful. Also on the CCBC website are um, book lists of um, books, uh, diverse books that they've pulled and and uh, collated there. Um, there's really more than you can ever find. There's also all sorts of other topics on there. It's an amazing resource. One of our state treasures. Fantastic. Thank you. And I, I don't know how many people know about it. So really great that you're sharing this. And I'm sure they do incredible work sharing it, but there's still so many people that don't know about it. Um, so you had talked a little bit about some tips for sharing books with young children. So say I'm a parent who has a super active child, maybe with some, you had mentioned some attention deficits or whatever. How do you just begin the reading process if they're just running around, not paying attention at all? Can you provide any tips for that? Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say, remember, short attention spans are absolutely normal fix. It's not something to medicate, you know, nothing of that sort. But if a parent thinks of reading aloud to their young child, if it's not been modeled in their environment, so they haven't picked it up from others, if they think of it the same way that they might think of um, the second, third, fourth grade reading aloud, where one child reads exactly what it says on the page and everyone else quietly sits and listens, well, that's not going to work with a 15-month-old. So we do something, the technical term is dialogic reading where you make the experience of looking at a book something interactive. So we tell them, hey, sit your child up in your lap, give them the book, let them turn the pages, let them go backwards in the book if they want, let them pick out random pages, talk about the pictures. So for example, if you're looking at Where the Wild Things Are by Murray Sendak, right, the classic that so many people know, um, you, you don't have to read the story. You can say, hey, can you help me find Max in this picture? Where's Max? Oh, there he is, what's he in? Oh, you're right, it's a boat. What color is that boat? Yes, it's a red boat, right? And even if you just get a few pages in, that still retains the familiarity with books and the experience of looking at books together. So when your child is three or definitely four, five, they will sit and quietly listen to that story and you've not lost this notion of let's sit and, and look at books together. That's perfect, thank you. Um, we have a comment and question here from Stefan Peterson uh, saying, thank you for your work. I'm a white dad with black kiddos and you were the first doc and still have the books you gifted at each visit. We went overboard on the books about diversity to the point where my daughter would say, not another black book. 
we've <laughs> learned, but notice how hard it is to continue finding glass for them, especially as they get older. <laughs> yeah. How can we more actively support in, or influence the creation of more diverse books simply by being a consumer and buying them? Are there incubators or ways to encourage new authors? Great question. That is a fantastic question. So yes, certainly finances matter, right? So so buying those books, recommending books for purchase to others um, all helps. If you're looking for more engagement around this, then I would recommend looking at organizations like We Need Diverse Books. Um, that is a national organization. They have some state chapters, et cetera, where they're trying to support uh, authors and illustrators doing some advocacy with publishers. Um, all those sorts of things um, help make a difference and help elevate. And also looking for talent, right, that is out there that may not be able to pursue a dream of becoming an author or an illustrator, right? Um, scholarship funds and things of that nature that say, how do we diversify the authors and illustrators that are out there that are doing this sort of work um, and encourage those that have been successful in this, in this realm um, to help build up that that generation of uh, of uh, of others. So I would start with we need diverse books. They uh, they do incredible work. Thank you. Um, Monica Millen says I'd like to learn more about the science behind reading across generations. I can't recall the exact phrase you used, but it was on the side of the hard part reading with a grandson. Mm -hmm. Of uh, relational health, I think was the uh, the term. So. Here's the thing. Um, for years, we've talked about shared book reading as being a literacy skill. And, and it is, right? Because the more you're exposed to books, the more you become a fluent reader eventually. You're able to learn how to decode text quickly. You're able to extrapolate from context, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? These are all the literacy, the, the decoding text type things that matter. However, we've come to recognize that it's not really just about that, that it's also about building these opportunities for these back and forth connections between children and families. Because here's the thing, all the research has shown that when loving, caring adults are spending time interacting with children, okay, this means no, you know, this is not about the iPad, this is not about the educational DVD or the toy or anything like that, it's about caring human beings interacting with young children, that's what drives development forward. That's the thing, okay? The, 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 the DVD on its own does nothing in a two-year-old. They'll tell you it's educational. Yeah, they're just trying to sell this thing to you, um, right? It's when you have the parent or other caregiver in there. This is a science that we're calling relational health. And if you want um, a more um, technical um, a look at it, although it's still pretty accessible. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a policy statement about promoting relational health. Just put that into Google, it'll come up, it's, it's freely available. Um, and that goes through all the references, there's heaps of, of peer reviewed journal articles in, in supporting this. If you just type in relational health or early relational health, you'll get other resources that are more parent aimed um, or general public aimed that talk about all these connections, but there is indeed a deep science behind that. And shared reading is just one of the ways that one can promote relational health. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing this great information and the wonderful resources here today. And I'm happy to say this uh, interview with you and, and your presentation will stay out on the Badger Talks Facebook page and Badger Talks YouTube page for everyone to refer back to and share with friends. So uh, Depeche, great to talk with you today. Thanks so much for sharing this important information with us. Same here, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, we're gonna continue celebrating the School of Human Ecology next Tuesday, October 18th at noon. We're gonna be talking with Dr. Janine Dilworth-Bart and she's gonna be taking us on a journey through the history of the Equity and Justice Network in the School of Human Ecology, as well as current and future goals uh, for the program. Visit us on badgertalks.wist.edu. You can see the, you can hear the podcast with Ben Rush where he interviews Depeche, a great conversation there. See the upcoming schedule of live talks, sign up for our email list, consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are 
uh, funded by a grant. And you can search the roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff who've signed up to give talks in communities like yours around the state. Also a shout out to the Wisconsin Science Festival. We're happy to be a proud partner in that event. Uh, I think they have about 500 events happening this week around the state. So certainly go to the website and see if there's something in your neck of the woods. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.